Hello everyone, welcome to episode 10 of my beginner's guide to procedural generation. This tutorial will be set out a little differently to my previous ones, so please do let me know what you think and if you prefer this format over my previous one. This episode, we will be continuing our understanding of how we can utilize the node system to procedurally generate levels. Previously, we explored how we can use a basic node system to spawn items in a specific location, specifically creating an ore item. This episode, we will be showing off how we can use the node system to link objects together, which we could later utilize to create levels, buildings, and rooms. Before we dive into the code, let's understand what it is we are trying to do and how. For a quick recap, a node system can be easily explained as a set of points or locations which we will use to connect or spawn objects. Take this example of two cubes. We can generate nodes around the cubes, per our rules, and then link the two where the nodes meet. In our previous example, we created the nodes manually using empty game objects, which means that we would have to create a node for every object and every direction. In this example, we will be dynamically generating the points, so how can we do that? We first need to set out a few rules. Where do the nodes need to be spawned? Let's say we want a node to be spawned on the right side of the object. We now need to calculate the center point of this object, of which we can do by taking the object's scale and dividing by 2. Now that we have the center of our cube, we need to specify how far we want our nodes to be from our object using an offset. I found that the best value is negative 1. Finally, we need to take our object's position into account. And if we put everything together, we get this formula, which will calculate the position of our right node. If we wanted the cube to have nodes on the left, front and back sides, we would reuse this formula changing the direction. Now that we have a better understanding of how we will generate our node positions, let's jump into the code. First and foremost, we're going to need to create three new files. A public class called node data, a public class called block object, which inherits from mono behavior, and a public class block spawner, which also inherits from mono behavior. Firstly, in our node data, we create a public variable called node position. This will be read only. We then need to create a constructor so that we can assign our node position. Now that our node data class is defined, let's move on to the block object. In the block object script, the first thing that we're going to do is define our variables. You need a float node offset, a list of colors, and a list of node data. Now we can move on to defining our functions. The first thing we're going to do is our onDraw gizmos. What we want to do is be able to see the points on the objects themselves so that we know that our calculations are correct. Now we can move on to our awake function which will populate our node data list, calling on our getCenterPoints method. Now we can move on to our getCenterPoints which is the bulk of our calculations of the points. The first thing we're going to want to do is create a temporary list called points. Taking the calculations that we saw in the infographic earlier, we know that we need to have a direction a scale, which we divide by two to find the center point, a certain offset, and then we need to add the position of the object itself. That's it for our block object script. We can now move on to defining our block spawner. As per usual, the first thing we're going to do is define our variables. We need a block object array called block objects, an integer called room count, a block object called starter object, and a hash table called occupied positions. Our occupied positions hash table will be an enforcer so that we don't respawn objects on places that are already taken. In the start function, let's call on our initializing method called spawn object on node. To define our spawn object on node, we firstly need to create a starter position. For this, we'll call on vector 30. We then need to loop through our room count, get an offset of where we want to spawn an object, instantiate it move it to the offset, change its color, and then add it to our hash table. Since we already create a starter object, we need our loop to start from one instead of zero. In the create starter position method, the first thing we want to do is get a random index between a value of zero and our block object's length. 
We then go about assigning our star to object by pulling out a random object from our block objects and instantiating it, followed by adding it to our occupied positions hash table. Moving on to generating our offset value, we once again get a random index between zero and our node data. We then extract the node data and assign it to the selected node. Now we need to do some checks. We need to check if the position that we want to spawn on is already existent in our occupied positions hash table. If the position does exist, we enter recursion by recalling the same method until our if condition is false. We can then take our current object's position, add our node position and multiply that data by two. And finally, we move on to the change object color method. We once again get a random index between zero and our colors list. We then pull out the renderer and assign that color to the object itself. We've created and defined all our scripts. We can now move into Unity. In Unity, the first thing we want to do is create an empty game object called manager. Then we assign it the block spawner script and later we'll populate it with our block objects and our room count. Moving on to defining our actual block object, first thing we need to do is create a 3D cube, followed by attaching the block object script to. Then let's populate some colors. Once that's done, let's convert this cube into a prefab by dragging it into our assets folder. And lastly, let's go back to our manager, assign our room counts, take our cube prefab and drag it into the block objects array. And if we click play, we should see that the levels are being generated. Thank you for joining me on episode 10 of my series, A Beginner's Guide to Procedural Generation. I hope that you found this tutorial useful and please do let me know what you think of this new format. If you have any questions, please do leave them below or even better, join our Discord channel. This has been Russ and I'll catch you next time.